Good. All right. We're going to be in the book of Acts tonight, the sixth chapter. While you're turning there, uh, one of the things that I love doing as a musicianary, and uh, that's what the Lord gave me for <laughs> to title my new uh, CD, is because I, I, I get to uh, go around and do music a lot of different places, from, uh, from homeless shelters, we do a lot of homeless ministry uh, at our church, outreaches and whatnot, and uh, jail ministry, and then I get to uh, go out and do uh, concerts occasionally, and sing at uh, all size churches from home Bible studies to mega mega churches and everything in between so uh, it's very much a blessing but one of the things that I really like uh, looking at and I was looking at your bulletin uh, the upcoming March one they're proofing it Leanne's proofing it and whatnot and I got the uh, the current bulletin as well one of the things I love about uh, going around singing at different churches especially Calvary chapels is sometimes you see some bulletin bloopers you know, and I, now I didn't see any in yours. I'm going to look closer tonight in the hotel because I bet I can find some. <laughs> but probably not. It looks like very, very professional and very good. But I mean, sometimes you just can't help it. There's bullets and bloopers that, that get through the proofing and everything. So I wanted to share uh, a few of these tonight and um, uh, these bullets and bloopers from, from different churches just all over the United States that I've come across from time to time. So let me just share those with you. And again, we're going to be in the book of Acts tonight. This isn't the Bible study. But let me share some bulletin bloopers with you tonight. Listen to this one. Bertha Belch, a missionary from Africa, will be speaking at Calvary Methodist. Come here, Bertha Belch, all the way from Africa. <laughs> That's a serious belch, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. The sermon this morning, Jesus walks on the water. The sermon tonight, Searching for Jesus. <laughs> Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Don't forget your husbands. <laughs> the peacemaking meeting scheduled for today has been canceled due to a conflict. That's always a problem, isn't it? Remember in prayer the many who are sick of our community. Whoa. Don't let worry kill you off. Let the church help. <laughs> Miss Charlene Mason saying, I will not pass this way again, giving obvious pleasure to the congregation. <laughs> For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. <laughs> Hello. Barbara remains in the hospital and needs blood donors for more transfusions. She is also having trouble sleeping and requests tapes of Pastor Jack's sermons. <laughs> During the absence of our pastor, we enjoyed the rare privilege of hearing a good sermon when J.F. Stubbs applied our pulpit. The rector will preach his farewell message after which the choir will sing, Break Forth Into Joy. <laughs> Irving Benson and Jesse Carter were married on October 24th in the church sanctuary. So ends a friendship that began in their school days. <laughs> a bean supper will be held on Tuesday evening in the church hall. Music will follow. <laughs> oh yeah. At the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be, What is Hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. Eight new choir robes are currently needed due to the addition of several new members and to the deterioration of some older ones. <laughs> Please place your donation in the envelope along with the deceased person you want remembered. <laughs> Attend and you will hear an excellent speaker and heave a healthy lunch. Get it, not have, heave, yeah. The church will host an evening of fine dining, superb entertainment, and gracious hostility. <laughs> nah. Potluck supper. Potluck. <laughs> Potluck supper Sunday at 5 p.m. Prayer and medication to follow. <laughs> I think we'll do this. 
The ladies of the church have cast off clothing of every kind. They may be seen in the basement on Friday afternoon. <laughs> Don't have a basement here, so do you? Oh, good. Right about now, I'm thinking, Pastor Dude, man, this is the last time we're going to be able to have you, man. You know, <laughs> what's with the jokes, you know? Okay, the, this evening, there's only a couple more. They get better. This evening at 7 p.m., there will be a hymn sing in the park across from the church. Bring a blanket and come prepared to sin. <laughs> they forgot the G. Low self-esteem support group will meet Thursday at 7 p.m. Please use the back door. <laughs> it's real encouraging. And here's my favorite. Weight Watchers will meet at 7 p.m. at the First Presbyterian Church. Please use the large double doors at the side entrance. <laughs> Bulletin bloopers. From the United States to you with love. <laughs> Acts chapter 6, gang. Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. The book's called The Acts of the Apostles. I think it could very well be said that it's the acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. The Holy Spirit, the birth of the early church here, the book of Acts, it's an incredible book. It's an awesome book. Uh, I find it such an incredible thing. We're going through it on Sunday mornings back home in Jacksonville. Our men's study, our women's study, they're all, we're all going through the book of Acts. There's incredible things going on in this early church situation that we see. The church, this early church, continues to powerfully progress. Dr. Luke pens these pages and tells us of the progress. This early church movement, it's, it's spiritually supercharged, if you will, by the Holy Spirit, by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember the rushing wind in chapter 2? Remember they were praying for this very thing, the helper to come as Jesus had asked them in the first chapter of Acts in the 14th verse. They were praying for the Holy Spirit to come. Here He comes like a rush of wind and it all changed. The church was empowered. The birth of the church, the way of Jesus Christ was born. It was awesome. And so no matter what the setbacks that are occurring, whether it's a couple called Ananias and Sapphira holding back, remember that money from God, whether it's the religious leaders coming against this early church, these apostles, whether the setback might be uh, the apostles being put in jail, or even the earlier verses, the first six or seven verses of chapter six, we see the, the Hellenists coming, and those were the Grecian Jews those Jews that were born outside of the Jerusalem boundaries, and they were greatly influenced, the Hellenists. This doesn't mean that they're people from hell, the Hellenists. But they're Grecian Jews, and they're greatly influenced by the Greek culture. They speak the language. They've adapted. They've picked up customs and whatnot. And so they're called the Hellenists. And that was a setback because the first seven verses of chapter 6 or so, well, what, what happened initially is here come the Hellenists to the apostles, to Peter and John and the rest of them, and said, hey, we have an issue. Our widows are not being fed in the bread lines or whatnot. And so the Bible tells us in verse 1 there of chapter 6 that there was some murmuring going on. Murmuring is an undefinable distrust and talking about those in leadership. Remember the cartoon character Snagglepuss? That he was kind of a murmur, like you can never, it's never discernible, it's never distinguishable what's going on with murmuring. But they, there's murmuring and they come to the apostles and they say, hey, uh, these people, these, these widows of our culture, of the, Gre the Grecian uh, Jews, the Hellenists are not being fed. And really it was just simply oversight. It wasn't anything personal at all. And so we were told in verse 3 that part of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that wisdom and that discernment coming in and speaking um, to the apostles. And they say, hey, we've got the issue solved. We are called to teach and preach. We, we can't be working the tables, but you know what? You need to elect seven men. Remember, seven in the Bible is the number of completion. But you need to pick and choose seven men. And look at verse 3. Seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who may, we may appoint over this business. 
And so they say, we can't do it. We're called to teach. We're called to preach. Just like Pastor David here is called to, to study and to teach and to preach. And it's a beautiful thing uh, delegating and seeing servants scurrying about even here, serving uh, the Lord. Whether staff or volunteers, we're all serving the Lord uh, together. And so they elect these seven men to feed in the tables of the bread lines those uh, widows that were overlooked. It, again, it was not a personal issue. Sometimes we think that personal issues against us and maybe in the workplace and there's murmuring going on or somebody's murmuring when really it isn't anything personally against us at all and that was the case earlier in this chapter of Acts but whether it's Ananias and Sapphira lying whether it's the religious leaders coming against whether the apostles being put in jail or the murmuring the Holy Spirit comes through the Holy Spirit is spiritually supercharging this early church to get over these obstacles. And so the apostles in the first seven verses of chapter 6, they delegate to the Hellenists, to the Grecian Jews, to pick and choose these seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. And really, the first seven that they pick, this is the formation of the earliest deacons. And I'm going to assume you have deacons and elders here. The deacons are the ones that take care of the, the more uh, uh, material uh, needs of the church and whatnot. And the deacons are those that are uh, spiritually speaking, the, the, the spiritual elders of the church. And so one of the seven men chosen by the Hellenists to serve is Stephen. And that's how we're going to be looking at tonight. We're going to be looking at Stephen and Scripture, empowered by the Holy Spirit tonight, so look at it with me, if you will, Acts chapter 6, verse 8. And Dr. Luke says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, he did great wonders and signs among the people. And there arose some then from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians and Alexandrians and those from Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen spoke and then they secretly induced men to say we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God and they stirred up the people the elders and the scribes and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. And they also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at Stephen, saw his face as the face of an angel. Lord Jesus, we ask that your helper, the Holy Spirit, Lord, it's this pastor's prayer that your spirit would speak through me a foolish thing of this world indeed. But may you empty me of myself. May it be your spirit that speaks to each one of us tonight. And Lord, we pray that despite the circumstances, the obstacles in our life that we're facing right now, that we would have that godly glow as Stephen does, and that others would know that we're walking with you, that you're walking with us, and that we have that joy of Jesus, that peace that truly surpasses all understanding, knowing that you truly are always with us, God. Emmanuel, minister to us. Speak to us. Use us. Empower us with that dunamis baptism of your Holy Spirit, that dunamis dynamite power in the Greek, Lord. 
And may we leave here not just hearers of your word, but doers of it. I thank you for each and every precious person here tonight. Be with their pastor and his wife and the group of 28 that leave tomorrow. May they have a blast. May they be inspired and come back on fire. And may we leave here on fire tonight. In your precious name, we pray tonight, Jesus. And all God's people said together, Amen. 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 In Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, Jesus taught that those who are faithful in little things will be made rulers over greater things. If we desire to be used by the Lord, we must be faithful in whatever God gives us to do in the beginning days of our ministry. Now, although Scripture tells us in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, not to despise the days of small things, many people, many times, find themselves reluctant to do the seemingly insignificant tasks many times desirous of something grander, they feel that menial service is beneath them. But the way of the Lord is so much more different. The way of the Lord is that we first prove ourselves in the smaller things, and as we are faithful in them, well, then He gives us greater responsibility. Amen? It's scriptural. It's biblical. And the reward for faithfulness in service, it's greater service. You see? And Jesus came on the scene and He said something radical in Matthew chapter 10, verses 39, if you're taking notes, and essentially said this, hey, happiness is found in losing your life, in giving yourself away, happiness is found in serving, not in being served. In giving, not in getting. But see, so many times in these United States, we are a society that is obsessed with being served, with not giving unless there's a getting that comes back. But you see, that's contrary to Scripture. Jesus says no. And you see, I can speak as a selfish thing of this world when I was doing the sex, drugs, rock and roll thing and opening for these bands and everything. Listen, you know who it was all about? Me, myself, and I. Those were my three favorite people, me, myself, and I. And everything was about self-gratification. And maybe, just maybe, maybe, if you're here tonight and you're feeling somewhat blue, perhaps it's because you're not engaging yourself in serving others. Because you see, if we're just serving ourselves, guaranteed, we will be miserable. And you can get the biggest screen TV and the most awesome surround sound and the best guitar and all the coolest stuff and say, man, I've arrived, and you know what? It will never, ever, 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 ever satisfy. Why? Because the vacuum inside, it's a God-shaped vacuum. And it can only be filled by serving others. That's what Jesus was about. Serving others. If you're here tonight and you feel like throwing in the towel, Take up the towel instead. Take that towel and wash somebody else's feet. Serve. And you know what? Promised, guaranteed. If you're serving others, you will find yourself spiritually satisfied by the fact that you are serving others instead of self. And all at once, as you're serving someone else, you're refreshed. You're refreshed. Stephen, our scripture study here tonight, he modeled this ministry beautifully. 
Stephen did. You see, Stephen, he began his ministry by serving tables, by feeding widows. Not necessarily a glorious position, would you agree? Not an exalted ministry at all. But because Stephen was faithful with the small things, as Zechariah already told us this evening, well then Stephen was elected to the office of deacon in the fifth verse of the sixth chapter here. He was one of those seven men chosen by the early church, by the apostles, as being a man full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom and full of good works. And here, only two verses later, check it out, only two verses later, we see him doing great wonders and miracles among the people. And Stephen went from being a table server to a deacon to a miracle worker all because he was faithful at each spiritual step. Let's check out verse 8 together. Let's read it again. And Stephen, full of faith and power, he did great wonders and signs among the people. As you stop right there, and please give me your attention if you would. So here's Stephen. Here's this man. He's one of the magnificent seven. Remember that? He's one of the magnificent seven. He's, he's a man that verse 3 told us he's full of good reputation. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He's full of wisdom. And he's waiting tables in obedience to God's call. And the Bible tells us in verse 8, Dr. Luke says that this waiter is doing great wonders and signs among the people. Wow. That's cool. I've heard ministry referred to as the highest calling. Oh, oh ministry. Oh, you're in ministry? Yes, I'm in ministry. Wow, that's so cool. You're in ministry. What a high calling. You can't get higher than that. But you know what? There is no one highest calling. You see, whatever God has called you to do, that is your highest calling. If you're taking notes, write this verse down. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. What does the Apostle Paul tell us? Who was Saul here in Acts, later to be converted in chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. But Paul says this, whatever you do, Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, listen, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. If it's waiting tables, great. Do it as unto the Lord. If you do lawn maintenance, great, awesome. Do it unto the Lord. If you're a sanitation engineer, do the best you can do for the Lord. If you're a corporate guy, if you're a CEO of a multi-million, billion dollar business, you know what? Do it as unto the Lord. If you're a bellman, do it as unto the Lord. A bellman? Yeah. When we moved from Colorado Springs serving at the Calvary Chapel there to Jacksonville, Florida, and the Lord called us to go plant a church there in 99, 2000. And I'm like, man, I'm from a mega church, 20,000 people, Calvary, Fort Lauderdale, and then three or 4,000 people at Colorado Springs. And this is going to be easy, man. You just start a Bible study. and This is great. Bible Belt. I love it. And then finally I learned that you get a little bit more belt than Bible sometimes in the Bible belt. Amen to that. And thank God you're at a Calvary Chapel here. Not that we're the best, but you know that you're going to get a well-balanced diet in the Word of God. Amen? But 
I'm like, man, this is going to be a piece of cake. You know, I'll just start, you know, start this Bible. School. And the Lord's like, ah, and I'm thinking, I'm, there's no way I'm going to have to go get a tent making gig, you know, because I've been on staff at this church and that church and music ministry and everything. And the Lord's like, you need to go get a job. Go get a job. Well, Lord, my job is Jesus. I mean, that's what I'm called to do. The Lord said, you know, you need to go. And I ended up going down to Ponte Vedra Inn and Club in this real ritzy um, area, Ponte Vedra Beach in Jacksonville, Florida. And here's this five-star hotel. And really, it was the only job I could get. And um, I, I have a college degree and, and all that stuff and everything. I'm like, there's no way I'm going to have to. And, and the Lord said, I want you to work this job as a bellman because it's got flexible hours. And I had to wear, you know, the little monkey suit and the tie and everything like this and everything. And I'm like, you know, no way I'm going to do this. And I, and I ended up doing it. And I got to tell you something. I had a lousy attitude. I had a lousy attitude. For the first I'm ashamed to say three months, probably more, honestly, like six months, eight months. Because I'm like, I can't believe that I'm having to work a job like this. And I would come home, and I would complain to my wife, and i go, man, you know what they're doing now and everything, and I can't stand this. You know, look at this. I'm from Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. Dear God, you know, these people know who I was. You know, what do I need to do? And I came home one night, and my wife, Christy, here's what she said to me. She says, you know what? She said, I can't stand to hear any more of this. Your attitude is terrible. And she said, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. What, this, Jesus wants you to work this job and to do the best you can do at it. And you're being a, te a terrible mumbler and grumbler and complainer instead of doing unto the Lord the best that you can do. And so as soon as she said that, I looked, at the, I looked up to the Lord and I said, Lord, why did you give me this wife? <laughs> and he said, because you're an idiot. And you need some wisdom in your life. And so I'm going to speak through Christy. And and she was right. I had a terrible attitude. And from that point on, seven or eight months later after I got the job, I said, you know what? I'm going to be the very best bellman that I can be. Carrying luggage, waiting on people, getting tips. And you know that I was? Because I said, I'm going to do it for the Lord, not for me. For the Lord. For the Lord. And only, and I tell you this, so I went from being the bellman that had the worst attitude in the world to about six months after that becoming employee of the month only because of God. And you know, I was so proud of that in the spirit that I had this thing, you know, six months ago, a, a trophy for a bellman for a monkey suit. And then I was just like, you know, I'm so grateful, God, that you changed my stinking thinking, my terrible attitude and to be grateful for this job that you've given me. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Where do you work? What's your job? How's your attitude? Is it an attitude of gratitude? Or is it a mumbling and grumbling and murmuring and complaining about the boss, about the pay, about the situation. You see, Stephen, he's a waiter. This is one of God's men. He is a waiter. And because he's faithful in the days of small things, feeding bread to these widows, he's then elected as a deacon. And then he's doing, he's, listen, he's doing great wonders and signs among the people, great wonders as a waiter. And God wants to do great wonders through you at your workplace. But it all depends on where this is at right here. And let me tell you what. This is the hardest and the biggest battlefield. This six inches from here to here. This is where the battle is right here. Amen? Amen. Powers and principalities and spiritual th and, and uh, uh, stinking thinking. This is where it goes on. And you know what? If you will look at your job, and I will look at my job like Stephen did and say, Lord, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do it full on. I'm going to be the best I can be. I'm going to be the employee of the month for you. 
then you will bring glory to God in the workplace. You will be a ministry magnet. People will be coming to you. And some of you are already doing this. Many of you are already doing this. And those are the people that come to you on the other side of the cubicle or at the coffee maker. They say, can you please share that scripture with me that you were sharing at the water cooler? Because, well, they, you know, Daryl's going to divorce me. And I don't know what. And all at once, you, be, you go from a mumbler and a, a grumbler and a complainer to a Christ-filled Christian who God's going to use to do incredible kingdom business at your workplace. That's what this waiter Stephen's doing, you see. And God's using him in an incredible way. So here's this Grecian Jew. Here's this Hellenist. Here's Stephen. Good reputation. He's full of the Holy Spirit. He's full of wisdom. He's full of boldness. Stephen, a waiter, is doing wonders at his work by the Holy Spirit. And Stephen, the waiter, is getting ready to witness. Check it out with me, verse 9. Look at this. It's awesome. Great wonders and signs. And then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen. Here comes the spiritual warfare. Because listen, you've got to expect it. You know, sometimes we think, yeah, I'm full of the Holy Spirit and boldness and all this and untouchable. And then all at once it's like, what was that? Fiery darts. You're not watching your back. Praising the Lord on Mount Moriah. And meanwhile, the devil, you got a target painted on your back, a target. Satan, come get me. Because I'm praising the Lord. I'm not watching my back. But God is greatly using Stephen, this waiter, to do wonders. Okay? And here it comes. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And here it's coming up in the synagogue of the freedmen. Now, a synagogue was a local place of worship, a community center, if you will, for worship and for studying the scripture. Now, in contrast, the temple, there was only one temple in Jerusalem, and that was the central worship center for all Judaism. That was the ministry melting pot. They would all come to the temple. That's where all the Jewish rituals were, such as sacrifice. So there were many synagogues, both in Judea and throughout the Roman world, but the one referred to here, it was specifically for the Hellenist Jews, of which Stephen was one, from outside Jerusalem. And what's going on there again, you ask? Disputing. They're disputing with Stephen. It's interesting, isn't it? Here's this guy for God. He's on fire. He's got the baptism of the Holy Spirit going on. He's empowered. He has that dunamis power, that dynamite power. He's filled. He's doing great wonders. God's doing great wonders through him as a waiter. He's on fire for God. Signs and wonders, all these incredible things, boldness. He's this empowered witness. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does. It just empowers us for ministry. And Stephen's got it all going on for God. But there's a dispute. And you see, ultimately, he's going to be rejected by these religious rulers. But here's what the Lord was showing me as I was studying this. The dispute, it's not with Stephen. The dispute that these men had, it was with God. It wasn't personal. It wasn't really essentially at all against Stephen. It was against the Spirit of God. And you see, the same is true for you and for me, you see, when we get in these situations. And we say, how's come this person doesn't like me at work? How's come this family member won't even talk to me when I come home on Thursday nights after Monday? go, this was so cool. You know, we studied, Pastor David taught us this, and we studied, and they just go, huh, yeah, it's great. I don't want to hear it. And we take it for a well, while. They're, 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 they're against me. They don't even want to hear the script. They're not against you. They're having trouble with the Holy Spirit, with the Spirit of God. The dispute's not with Stephen. 
The dispute's with the Holy Spirit moving. The dispute isn't against you at the workplace, your neighbor, your family, your home, your situation. The dispute is with the Spirit. You see? Don't take it personally. You see, when I was a bellman at Ponte Vedra Inning Club, and even when I got an attitude of gratitude, I said, okay, God, this was full on for you. I'm going to stop the stinking thinking, the selfishness. I'm going to do this job. I'm going to be the best bellman I can be. And I started doing that. And months into it, and there was a guy there named Wayne. And he was a bellman. He was a lot younger than me. And we used to call him Wayne the Weasel because he kind of talked like this. He kind of had this lisp. And he would call me priest. And he would go, yeah, what's with you, priest? What, you think that, uh, I'm popping my piece here. And he says, what's with you, priest? You think you're better than everybody else and caring just because you got employee of the month, priest. I don't like you, priest. I don't like you. I don't like your Jesus. He was very bold and upfront and everything. He says, I don't like you. I don't like you. It was like Satan was talking to me. You know, I don't like you. You know, he hit me with his tail, and I'd see the horns, ah, the tongue, ah, I don't like you, praise. You ever experience that? And it's just like it's not even a person talking. It's just like, man, I've seen that fork tongue before, and the tail, and the horns, and the pit. This is the enemy talking through my husband, my wife, my unstable spouse, my, 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 my boss, my employee, my whoever it is. Absolutely it is. Now, I'm not going to say, oh, Pastor Keith taught us, Pastor David, about demon possession, you know, when he was here on that. I'm not talking about that. But listen, the enemy will come through someone many times who's not saved and speak, and he will come, and he will go for the juggler for Jesus for you. And you see, that's what, that's what the dispute is here. It's not against Stephen. It's against the Holy Spirit. It's not personal. When Wayne was coming against me, and you know what the Lord told me? Just love him. Just love him. Quit trying to defend yourself. Quit trying to come up with this stuff. Quit being sarcastic with him and cutting, you know, saying things back to him about his lifestyle with sleeping all the, with all the women on staff there in the hotel and everything. And just love the guy, man. And you know that he got won over because I stopped disputing with him. He was disputing with me, but I just... Maybe that's what the Lord wants you to do. Stop defending yourself and just let the Holy Spirit move and just love the person. Go, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'd like to take out a couple of Glocks, but <laughs> God doesn't want me to, you know? I'd take you out, you know? Nah, it's not what God wants us to do. That's not what Stephen does. How do you know? Well, check it out. So there's a disputing with Stephen. But look at verse 10 but they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen spoke. I like what the NIV and the NLT says. They were unable to stand against the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. They were unable to stand against it. Listen, check it out. Even though they were disputing with Stephen, they couldn't resist. They couldn't stand. They couldn't come up with anything against him. You ever deal with a situation like that? And somebody, they're adamantly opposed to you because you are what? A Christian. You're a Christ follower. You're Christ light. You're trying to walk this walk. Not just talk the talk. Be the best you can be for God. They say, you have a Wayne. You have a weasel. Or a, or a wean a wean Anna or whatever. And they're like, yeah, you know, I don't like you. You know, all these different things or whatever but they're not able to say anything to really come up against you. Why? Because the Spirit of God, Ephesians 3.17 says that the Holy Spirit lives in the heart of your home. And so really, again, the battle's against the Lord. And they can't, they're disputing with you, but they can't really say anything. To, they just know they don't like you, and you just know that they don't like you. So what do these religious leaders do in their dispute? about Stephen. Verse 11. So they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. So, 
they persuade some men to lie against Stephen that he'd been blaspheming Moses and God. And their lies, listen, their accusations against Stephen, they are attacking the very core, the very essence of the Jewish faith. The Mosaic Law, Moses, and God Himself. They're going right for the juggler. They say, hey, this Stephen guy, he's, 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 he's taken the crowds away from us. And these other guys, you know, these religious leaders, and they say, here's what we're going to do. And they're trying to find the thing that will hurt the most, that will have other people, what? Stir them up. The first part of verse 12 tells us that this stirs the people up. And isn't that what Satan wants to do, is stir the people up? And listen, Satan, the deceiver, the father of lies, he will keep going for it until he finds the right combination of things with you, with I, with Stephen, that will stir people up. It's exactly what he does until he finds the right thing. Now, about six months ago, we got a new dog. Our dog, Samson the Wonder Dog, this little dog, was a great dog, he finally uh, passed away, and so I said, no more dogs. That's it. We, we can't go through this again, because, you know, every, you, who's had a pet die, and you're close to the pet, and it's, it's like a family member, you know? It's like, wow. And I said, no more. So, and then what do we all do? A couple few months later, we go and we get another dog, and so we did that, and, and we got this black uh, lab named Nick, okay? He's about, oh, a year and a half. He's a big puppy is what he is. <laughs> you know, and, um, and Nick, uh, he is, uh, I, I call him demon dog. Uh, we love him to death. But uh, the dog has no problem, you know, tearing off the six-foot uh, pieces of wood, the fence in our backyard, and, you know, tearing them off and everything. So I think I've I replaced all 1,696 boards around the perimeter of the yard. So he doesn't pull those off anymore, but... Here's what he does. I was sitting at a breakfast um, a couple weeks ago uh, with my family, and, and, and he's out in the backyard by the pool, the, by the pool deck, and uh, we have a pool deck back there. And here's the dog, and um, and I'm sitting there talking, and I see the dog come up, and he's got like, and he's I'm looking out the window, and I go, what in the world's Nick got? I go, oh look, Dad, he's got a shirt, you know, he's got somebody's shirt, and he's looking through the window like that and everything. I'm like, okay, but but it's an old shirt, Dad. It's already ripped up. It doesn't matter. Okay, let him go. So he goes back running in the yard and everything. And then we're talking. The next thing I know, here's something else, and he's got a he's got a boogie board for the pool, you know, one of those little styrofoam surfboards. And he's, he's got that, and I'm like, what's the dog have? No, it's a boogie board. But Dad, it's already chewed up. He chewed that up last month. And we're like, okay, okay. And so just let it go and everything. Thing and just, man, that dog's crazy. He's possessed. You know, we got to get an exorcist to call a dog exorcist or something. Dog's crazy, you know. And so the next thing I know, um, I'm talking and everything, and I see him coming up, and he's, and he's looking up in the window, and I go, he's got my barbecue tools, and he's looking at me like this. And that was the right combination. I'm out of the, Nick, I'm running out the backyard, you know, going, Nick, I'm going to kill you. And there's the crazy pastor again that wants to kill his dog, you know, the next door neighbor and everything. But listen, he was looking, check it out, listen. He was looking for the right combination to get the attention to stir it up. And he found it, and he pushed my buttons. And I went out there. He stirred me up. And isn't this exactly what Satan does? He stirs it up. In the case of Stephen, they start lying and slamming Moses and lying and saying, Stephen's, he's, Stephen's saying this stuff. He's talking smack against Moses, about Moses, about the Mosaic law, about the temple. And they're lying and see. Satan finds that combination that ticks them off and stirs them up. And maybe he's found the right combination with you. And it's caused you, listen Christian, to take your eyes off the cross and to become more concerned and you're all stirred up. But now the Holy Spirit is not quite as strong as he was last week, last month, last year. Because why? You're all stirred up and now you're obsessed 
with the fact that this is going on at work or at home or in your marriage or, your family, or whatever it is. And you know what? What's happened? He's got you. He's got you. The devil has diverted attention from the cross to the crime. Such is the case with Stephen. And see, the enemy will use people. And maybe that you're facing that. You've got people that are coming against you. Listen, they're lying. They're saying things that are not true about you to stir you up, to get you going, to get you all riled, to get you to jump ships from the guy for God who used to be about praying for the boss. And now you're on the other side of the Red Sea, slamming the boss with everybody else because they've come against you. They're coming against Stephen. They're lying. Satan has found the right combination to get them going. What happens next? They stirred up the people. Look at verse 12. The elders and the scribes. And they came upon Stephen and they seized him. That's what the enemy does too. He'll seize you. He'll come against you. He'll steal the joy of Jesus from your life. And they come upon Stephen, but they're not going to steal the joy from Stephen of Jesus. We'll see that. But they seize him. And what do they do? And look, and they brought him to the council. They bring him to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the Jewish Supreme Court. Okay? They bring him before the big dogs is what they do. And they set up false witnesses. And false witnesses translates here to hired liars. They're paying people to lie, to talk smack against Stephen. Now, maybe these people that are against you, they're not being paid with money. But something else is feeding the fact that they're coming against you. They're saying things. It's exaggerated. It's manipulated. False witnesses, are, they're coming against you. Well, they're coming against Stephen here. They came against Jesus. Many times I think we think we're immune. I'm following God. Things are going great. You know, why? And then all at once, again, fiery darts. And Peter says, remember Peter says, he says, why do you find it surprising that you're going through these hard times? Suffering. Don't you know that Jesus suffered? And don't you know that it's an honor, an honor, listen again, an honor to suffer as our Savior suffered for us. It's a ministry of suffering. It's not the way to grow a, ch a church. You don't put it out on the sign and say, it's a ministry of suffering. If you want to suffer for Jesus, come on in. Oh, no, I don't want to suffer. But you know what? It is part, people, of being a Christian. Stephen's going to suffer. In the last couple verses of chapter 7, we won't see it. But you know what? He is not losing his composure. He is sticking with Christ Jesus. He is not going to give up. He's standing tight with Christ. But they set up, these religious leaders set him up with false witnesses, with hired liars who said, here's what they say, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place, against the temple. Uh-oh. Lying against the temple. And the law. See how they're going for the juggler? Satan's found the combination to stir the people up. For we have heard him say, that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Now, here's Stephen. He's brought before the Sanhedrin. 
He's being lied against. Hired liars coming against him. The false witnesses, they tell, listen, a half-truth, of course, because Jesus did say that they would destroy this temple and He would, remember that, raise it up again. But He was, of course, speaking of what? The temple of His, his body. Remember that? Okay? And at His trial, the false witnesses for Jesus too, well, they misunderstood and they misrepresented that. So here with Stephen, it's the same thing. They also misunderstand Stephen when he says that the temple in Jerusalem will be left desolate. Destroy this place. So they misunderstand him. And actually it was desolate without Christ anyway. But they twist everything that he's saying about the customs of Moses. And their accusations are only based on a half-truth. What is a half-truth? It's a lie. It's a lie. Satan has found the right corrupt combination to slam Stephen. Liars are hired. This guy's against the Mosaic law. This guy's saying that the temple will come down, just like that Jesus guy. This guy is of the way. This guy needs, we need to do some serious things with this guy. Half truths. And so, what does Stephen do? I'll tell you what I would do. In the flesh, what I would do? Somebody's going to come against me, somebody's going to come and lie against me. Hey man, double glocks, you know. I'm going to take you out. And there's no way you can, you can run, but you can't hide because I'm the governor. And I'm going to take you, I'm going to lay you out flat. I'm going to take you out. And this is exactly what Stephen does, right? He says, you know what? I'm a godly guy, but I've got my limits. Here's my ministry machete. I'm going to take some heads are going to roll. I'm taking it out. Isn't that what he does? And he says, you know what? I am tired of you guys lying and gossiping against me. And so here he comes and he starts cutting heads off, right? No. Not at all. What does he do? Verse 15 tells us, Dr. Luke says this, And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at Stephen, they saw his face as the face of an angel. Wow. Wow. Addressing his students concerning ministry, Charles Spurgeon said this, Men, when you teach on heaven, let there always be a glow on your face, a gleam in your eye, and a smile on your lips. And when you teach on hell, your normal face will do fine. <laughs> Listen, Christian, As the lies fly, as the false witnesses point their fingers in his face, as all the false accusations and the disputing and the lies and the anger that preceded the rocks that would soon follow in the 59th and 60th verse of the 7th chapter, Stephen, this waiter, this witness, this deacon, who was faithful with the small things, who's been lifted up, filled with the Holy Spirit, with wisdom and faith and power. Stephen's face, in the face of all this stuff, it reflects neither hatred nor horror, but heaven. His face looked like the face of an angel. Christian, as 
we prepare to close here soon, listen. What's the look on your face at your workplace? Things aren't going the way that you want it to, that you thought it would go. What's the look on your face with your family situation? Is it a godly glow? Is it like Moses on the mount where he came down and the people said, man, check it out. Something's going on with Mo. Look at him. What? <laughs> He's got the godly glow going on. Is that you? Is it a godly glow? Or is it a scowl? Is it a dissatisfaction? Are you being faithful in the days of small things? Like Stephen. So that the Lord can give you greater things and greater responsibilities. But listen, He has to know that He can trust you with the little stuff. So you can be tra trusted with the bigger stuff. You see? with how you treat your kids, your spouse, your boss, your employees, your neighbors. Stephen's got the joy of Jesus. All the way to the bitter end. And he'll basically essentially say at the end of chapter 7 as they're stoning him, He'll essentially say the same thing that Jesus did on the cross at Calvary. Father, forgive them. They know not what in the world they're doing. Forgive them, God. Forgive them for slandering me at the workplace. Forgive him, her, for saying this stuff, talking this smack, lying against me. Because, Lord, I know that they're not coming against me. They're coming against you. And give me a godly glow like Stephen in the face of these circumstances. Turn with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. These are the characteristics of a Christian. Uh, and I want you to look, and I, and I really believe that what we're seeing in Stephen's situation right now, this is what he's doing. This is what's being described by Paul. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. And this is for you and me too. Listen. Colossians 3, verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, that's your address, my address, Christian, holy and beloved, Put on tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Look, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. It's not a request, it's a command. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful, and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing all one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, Christian at Calvary Chapel Triad. You do it in word or deed and do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through Him. Do it all for the Lord. What I want to do, we've only got a couple minutes left. 
what I'd like to do, what I feel led to do, is just close with a, a simple song. I think many of you will probably recognize it. Call people get ready. And maybe, just maybe, just maybe, our scripture study tonight, you say, man, I can relate to Steve. Because boy, are they throwing rocks at me. At the homestead the workplace half truths man lies accusations things that's being pointed and I've been like you Pastor Keith when you're talking about that Bellman story I've been a Grinch at the workplace man I have not been godly been unappreciative, not an attitude of gratitude, of ingratitude. And let's stand together as we prepare to close. And this song is about, it's written by Curtis Mayfield, it's called People Get Ready. It's about a train that's coming, spiritually speaking. And Jesus Christ is the conductor. Here's what I believe, spiritually speaking, just as an illustration. That this train is parked at the trial at Calvary Chapel. And you know who the conductor is? Christ Jesus. And here's what he's saying. All aboard! And perhaps you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And here's what you need to know. God has a first class seat. Jesus the conductor has a first class seat reserved for you with your name written on the seat. And that train is stopped here right at the trial. And you know what color your name's written in? Scarlet red, man. Blood. It was shed for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever shall believe with him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And Paul says in Romans that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to close in this simple song. And if you would like a relationship, not anything to do with religion, but a relationship with Jesus Christ tonight, Here's what I'm going to ask you to do, to be bold, be strong, to come forward, to stand in front of this altar or kneel down and say, God, you have my address. I want to know you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Or I'm the guy at the workplace. I'm the gal. My witness has been terrible, and I need to get it right for you, God. Whatever the case, I'm going to sing this song. There are going to be some prayer counselors up front to pray with those of you that may come forward and just allow the Lord to minister to you through this song tonight. People get ready. This is what we'll close with. And if that's you, if God has just touched your heart in any way tonight, you want to know Jesus is Lord and Savior, you just need prayer for yourself in any ways, to be grateful for the days of small things, whatever it might be, just come forward.
a train coming You don't need no ticket You just get on board And all you need is faith Yes, you do Here is diesel humming You don't need no ticket you just thank the Lord. If that's you, come forward tonight. You say, people, get ready. I am here for you tonight. People, get ready. There's a train and it's coming. It's picking up passengers. Faith is the key. Open the doors and board them. There's room for all. Yeah. If you'll just love your Lord. to accept Jesus Christ in your life tonight and just say these words out loud in your heart tonight dear Lord Jesus I am a sinner I fall short God I need you so desperately in my life Jesus I believe you that you died on the cross for me God that you are Lord that you are saved that I am saved, by your stripes I am healed, and that tonight I come to the cross, I come to you Lord Jesus, and I say, Father forgive me, Father accept me, into your loving arms, thank you Jesus, for tonight, February 26th, 2009, I shall be known from here on out as a Christian, as a Christ follower, Christ-like. Or if you're the one at the workplace, the witness has been poor, dear Lord, or at home or wherever, make me like a Stephen, that I can have that godly glow, that I can have, look like an angel rather than like somebody else, God. That I would work my job, I would lead my family as you've called me to, Lord.